this morning. We're uh, very pleased to be uh, speaking with uh, Jean-Pierre Noel, CIPD companion, executive remuneration coach, trainer and mentor. Uh, JP brings nearly three decades of experience in uh, international HRM, including uh, half that time working at uh, board level with uh, a series of FTSE top 50 multinationals. Um, uh, JP is currently chair of the remuneration group, uh, the independent network group of FTSE 100 uh, reward directors formed to consider policy and practice, as well as uh, uh, confidential information sharing about executive uh, remuneration uh, for executives. And then bridging the worlds of uh, policy and practice into academia, JP is uh, an MBA tutor at the Side Business School at the University of Oxford uh, and a reward tutor with the CIPD. JP, thank you very much for uh, making the time to talk today. It's a great pleasure. Good to see you, Stephen. Um, in building up this impressive profile, um, what have you observed over those past 30 years about executive remuneration that's given you particular pause for thought? Uh, I guess really it's, it's changed enormously, particularly since the financial crash, which um, many have attributed to being down to the remuneration in banks, encouraging excessive risk taking and excessive focus on, on the short term. And, and what that really prompted was a, a raft of, of new legislation, including um, the binding vote around executive pay, executive remuneration. Um, and that really, I guess, forced companies to take a much more considered approach to what they were doing in the whole area of policy, practice and executive pay. Disclosure requirements became much more stringent. Um, and so I think the whole area and focus and scrutiny has really intensified certainly in, in the space of time that I've been working in, in the reward area. Uh, yes, indeed. So an awful lot uh, going on there. Um, you, you have made the comment, and I want to uh, play the quote back to you, that the nature and context of executive remuneration makes the role of those who operate in this field complex, challenging and high profile. Uh, could you uh, uh, unpack that for us, please? Yes, I think, I mean, the, the role really when you go into the executive reward space, and particularly when you become the head of reward, is quite different to working purely in-house because you're exposed to a very different group of stakeholders. So that would include the board members, the non-executive directors, who are not employees of the company, but are there for helping to manage the oversight of the organisation, as well as investors, shareholders, um, there are uh, proxy bodies that you'll be having contact with. And so the range of stakeholders will be quite significant. And that makes it much more difficult to navigate through because what you're really trying to balance is different viewpoints, different perspectives. A lot will also depend in listed companies on the profile of the shareholder makeup. So, you know, are you really working with a few consolidated shareholders that have got a large shareholding? Or with multiple shareholders, which can make it even more complex with the kind of navigating through what their different perspectives or views or expectations might be on executive pay. Um, and all of this also is then uh, going to be subject to a shareholder vote. And um, so actually how you uh, position and write the director's remuneration report, which is part of the annual report, will be very important. And how you manage the consultation with the different stakeholders is also very important. So a very different kind of profile and setup than if you're working purely in-house in, in a, maybe a more junior role or maybe in another facet of HR. And I think all of this also requires you to be very savvy in terms of how does the business make money effectively? So the sort of commercial awareness, the link between what you're doing in remuneration and how you are linking that with the business needs and strategy is, is really crucial and is again something which builds trust and engagement with the stakeholders and, and understanding how to position that is, is vital. Well, yes, indeed. Um, it, it's interesting, uh, a whole multiplicity of activities, um, the need 
um, as you say, to have that big picture, how do organizations make money, um, as well as getting into the specificities of what shareholders are looking for, that crucial say on pay legislation and working through that. And so transparency being ever more important. Um, and, and clearly the controversy surrounding executive reward um, its management, its disclosure, uh, not not uh, abating in, in any sense. So um, a great deal going on there. Um, when uh, you kindly fed into our research um, around ongoing developments in executive reward management, I asked you about the interplay of um, so-called independent external advisors and those people within the organisation um, you, you've just talked about the preparation of um, annual report and accounts and the um, director's remuneration report within it. I recall at the time of our research conversation that you made the point that whilst the consultants um, employed um, in accordance with best practice directly by the REM committee um, are involved maybe as part of that process, actually the people on the inside the um, internal professionals who specialise in supporting executive reward management continue to play a really crucial role in crafting messages and that in fact rather than see people sitting in separate silos um, actually there's quite a lot of collaboration taking place behind the scenes. Could, could you just um, reflect on that and indeed over the past two three years since we had that conversation do you think things have uh, changed in any way in that respect? I think it's certainly in terms of the in, internal um, connections, I think it's really important, I would say, to make friends with people in a number of different um, facets of the business. So, you know, investor relations will be an obvious one in terms of really understanding what are the expectations of shareholders, um, what's going to be on their plate, what's going to be on their radar. Um, thinking about the finance colleagues, because they will be enormously helpful when it comes to things like modelling. Um, you know, bonus incentives and looking at potential payout, looking at past history, et cetera. The strategy function is also critical to really understand what is the future direction of the organization, what's the future of work look like for us, what does that mean translate to in terms of the sort of behaviors and results that reward can help influence, um, and communications department as well in terms of thinking about how you're landing the message not to forget your colleagues in other facets of HR. So what you're doing in the reward space was very much directly linked with the talent agenda, with performance management, how you're thinking about manpower planning, et cetera. So all the different departments really are helping to input and shape what you're doing in the reward space. And again, I think as a reward professional, you are absolutely taking external advice, input from consultants, and thinking about what are you know, contemporary practices, what is the legislation you need to be aware of. But ultimately, what you're really doing is translating that into what's going to work for your organization. So it shouldn't be a kind of cookie cutter approach. It really needs to be tailored to what an organization needs, what is the culture, what are the values, how is what you're doing in reward, driving and enabling that. And that isn't a kind of one size fits all. It's not a kind of paint by numbers. Um, strategic reward man management really requires judgment. Um, an application of the theories and policies that are in play. I mean, you're absolutely right about this need um, not just to take the uh, cookie cutter approach. Um, one of the things that we've explored in uh, our research again is around this idea of institutional isomorphism using the jargon, people copying one another. <laughs> um, and one of the things that uh, when we talked to some um, of the big institution investors, they said, you know, in a way, perhaps we're responsible for that because we're asking um, organization, although we, we talk a good game in terms of, oh, yes, you know, we want to look for um, the uh, strategic and competitive differences. In fact, the way in which we're monitoring this now, given the onus on the institutional investors on behalf of the, the, the shareholders, their clients um, to uh, manage and provide oversight and inform voting. Um, in fact, it can become a bit of a straitjacket. Um, alongside that, um, some of them said, and, and this is why I'd be interested in your take, given what you described as the role for uh, the lead person around executive reward as a specialist, 
Um, they, 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 and, and you talked about the interaction with the shareholding community. Um, some of the institutional investors said, well, you know, past experience has been um, some of the people inside the big corporations, they've actually been a bit reluctant to give us access to those people with whom we could have real nitty gritty conversations to understand the business, to understand where the policies and practices came from. Um, I mean, I don't know if you think that's a fair observation, um, but also, do you think in the light of certainly the way you were talking to it about transparency and engagement with a, a wide range of stakeholders, obviously including shareholders and their yeah. reps, is that changing? Um, I would say it's it's quite challenging actually sometimes getting engagement. So um, I think a lot will depend again on the shareholder base that you have. So if you have a, a very kind of high weighting on a few key large shareholders, it's much easier to get engagement. If you have a shareholder base with lots of shareholders with say one or two percent, it's much more challenging because obviously it's not such a big weighting of the portfolio that your company might be. And so I think that is a kind of key determinant, actually, in terms of the degree to which you're going to really get that, that engagement with investors is, is how much stake in your company do they have, which translates to how much vested interest do they have. Um, and in some cases, it is a case of a little bit of a direction of what their expectations are without that willingness to engage always. So I would say that's the kind of the key determinant. So I'm not sure I've seen a, a change in it, but I see a different emphasis depending on what the, the stakeholder is. Yeah. And, and what about um, inside the organisation um, in terms of the executive reward professional being part of the group that are having that conversation now to inform um, stakeholder understanding shareholder voting um, is that something that um, some um, members of the corporate team uh, who, who don't come from the HR and uh, reward background uh, are jealously guarding or do you think that um, the reward professional the expertise is being welcomed as part of that um, dialogue now because of the value added that uh, can come through yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, most of the shareholders would prefer to see any of those sort of conversations fronted by the um, head of the remuneration committee. So the chair of the remuneration committee is the role that they would really see as taking the lead of that. And I think where the head of the board comes into play is supporting that process and um, potentially attending meetings, ideally attending meetings so that they can ask questions, answer questions directly. Um, but I think there's a kind of expectation really from investors that that chair of the remuneration committee role will take the lead. And I think part of our role as rule professionals is ensuring they're sufficiently briefed and have the right Q&As prepared in advance and have the capability in order to be able to front it. And that absolutely could be with the support of you know, CFO or other roles in the organisation input into the process of what might be on the table or what might be discussed with the investors. Um, but that's kind of where I've seen it generally happening is it re generally the, the chair of the remuneration committee in tandem with the head of reward is usually the two key people. Um, less often others actually physically in the room, but absolutely inputting to the process. Right. Um, and that's the whole point, given the emphasis now with the chair of the REM committee you know, even more accountable, um, yeah. their, their uh, neck um, on the, the block, as it were, um, uh, it, it's pretty crucial. In, in the past, one gained the impression that sometimes non-exec directors, um, whether or not they were chairing a, a crucial committee like uh, remuneration, again, weren't necessarily part of that conversation. The way you've just outlined it, it sounds as though certainly the REM committee chair is more and more um, involved uh, because they need to be. And indeed, one would think that as a non-exec, they would um, make sure that they're advocating for their own position because uh, it's their reputation uh, on the line. Um, it, it actually opens up, I think, in terms of thinking about the head of um, reward, um, quite a delicate um, dance that uh, they have to play between their chief executive on the one hand and the uh, REM um, committee chair on the other. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a long time ago now for me, but I, I well remember 
um, in, in playing that role, having to work between um, obviously a very strong chief executive, but equally because there are, there are people who are running big companies uh, elsewhere, very strong um, remuneration committee chair and what they expect of you. And uh, I, again, could, could you talk a little bit about, as I say, it's, I'm afraid uh, my practical experience of playing that role uh, is uh, um, got, got the uh, cobwebs around it. You're obviously far more up to date, but any thoughts on that? And, you know, the, the advice for people who aspire to the head of reward role as, as to how they manage that delicate uh, balance of relationships? Yeah, I mean, I think it can be quite a tricky role because you often are navigating quite different perspectives or viewpoints or angles that you're coming at. And I think the key thing is you've got to be the honest broker in this and really kind of have the courage of your convictions to push back when necessary and challenge, clearly listen as well. But I think all of it's got to be framed within the kind of bigger picture of what is the organisation looking to achieve. So the starting point, I think, should always be actually what are we about as a culture? What are our values? What is the vision? What is the strategy of the organisation? And that should be informing what you're doing in reward. And then I think in the reward space, what you're trying to do is demonstrate evidence for what you have in place. What's the impact? What's the effectiveness? How are you measuring, measuring the return on investment? So you're dealing with it as much as possible in terms of what are the hard facts or what are the consequences to reputation or financial of not doing something in a certain way, for example. And um, I think that is a key way of kind of managing it is very much through data facts, evidence-based, very professional in terms of how does this all align up with what you're trying to achieve as a business. And having, you know, in some cases, quite robust and honest um, dialogue with people. But at the end of the day, you know, you have a common purpose, which is what are we here for in terms of our bigger purpose for the organisation? And I think that should almost be the, the guiding star, as it were. Yeah, as you rightly say, what is the organisation trying to achieve? How can we use data to underpin the kind of advocacy that's being taken forward? Um, but again, just in terms of those uh, interpersonal human relationships, frankly, people who get to run big businesses, people who get to become non-execs, um, who are either still running or have run big businesses, they're, they're quite big personalities themselves. And having to uh, <laughs> become between them can be quite a challenge sometimes. Um, I, I, I don't know whether I, I've got this right, but I, I actually found um, that sometimes both parties, whether it was the REM committee chair or the chief exec, they could almost be quite indiscreet in the conversation they'd have with you. Um, and you'd think, to begin with, oh, I'm a bit concerned, but actually, I think that was intentional um, indiscretion because they knew that you, as the conduit, were going to be able to inform in a way perhaps they couldn't do um, within the formal setting to inform the dialogue between them. I, I, am I barking up the wrong tree, or is there something? No, in I think that's absolutely right. I think they can have the very kind of honest conversation with you. And it's really important that you understand exactly where they're coming from. And it might not be exactly what's presented ultimately. But I think a lot of around uh, what you're doing in the executive reward space in this companies is the preparation ahead of formal meetings. So when you get to the formal remuneration committee meeting, it would be a failure, I would say, if there wasn't ultimately approval to what you're presenting because you should have had a round of you know, iterations and conversations so that there are no kind of left field surprises. I mean, clearly there'll still be dialogue and still there could be um, issues that still need to be resolved. But by and large, it should be the case that the preparation you've done through pre-meetings and side conversations and um, understanding where people are coming from, you've addressed the main issues um, that are likely to occur. So ideally, you'd have no surprises when it comes to the final committee meeting after. Certainly that's the way I've always worked it in the past is try and get that kind of dialogue and communication ahead of the formal um, remote code. 